Next, Columbus Neighborhoods celebrates 100 episodes with some of our most popular stories. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by American Electric Power is proud to sponsor WOSU Public Media Columbus Neighborhoods. Working together with our communities, we're committed to powering a bright, boundless future for us all. At Ohio Health, we believe it's important to have a healthy understanding of the world around you. That's why we're proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media and their work to educate, entertain, and inspire the people we serve. Bailey Cavalieri, your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. And by viewers like you. Thank you. You know, I can't believe it's finally here, our 100th episode. I know, I'm looking for the cake. Hey, bring it on. <laughs> and it all started with our first show about the short north, and the series has continued with countless stories about neighborhoods all over central Ohio. So how about if we celebrate this momentous occasion with a few of the stories that our viewers have enjoyed the most? Great idea. Let's start off with this next story, all about houses here in Columbus that were selected and ordered from a Sears catalog. The early 20th century was a period that was marked by the kit home and the idea that you could buy a home that all of the pieces came and could be assembled on your lot uh, became very popular really around 1906-1908 with Sears having catalogs in virtually every home in America realized that they could be selling more than furnishings for the home, they could be selling the homes themselves. They were not the only company that did this, but I think the Sears homes are the ones that are probably the best known. I think there's a misconception that these were inexpensive homes. Cheap homes, not at all. Uh, there was a range of architectural styles, again, reflecting the period, starting with four squares, bungalows, and craftsmen, going way up to about 1940 when they stopped producing these homes right before World War II began. There are some quite large, uh, quite um, extensive, beautiful homes. I mean, they had 10-room homes, 12-room homes. They may have ranged in price from the upper eight, nine hundred dollars to maybe five, six thousand dollars. Again, these were pretty substantial homes for the time period. They shipped them by train and they came with everything. They came with the beams marked, they came with the exterior materials, they came with essential heating, which was a big deal in the early 20th century. They were wired, they had plumbing, they had all the fixtures, all the woodwork, and everything was numbered and cut to order. And it's truly remarkable that these homes fit in so well to neighborhoods that were being developed. Because of the range of architectural styles, because of the range of materials, you could virtually find a style to fit into any neighborhood that was being developed across America at the time. These little twin bungalows behind me have a secret. They were built in the fall of 1927 by Robert Bazard. He had just graduated from Worthington High School a couple of years before. His father was a builder and he had obviously learned the techniques helping his dad. And these houses we know from the newspaper uh, were built in six weeks. They uh, excavated the basements the last week in September and his parents and the next door neighbors, the Whitemans, moved in in mid-December. There were uh, variations of this particular model, which apparently um, Robert Bazard liked very, very much. He, uh, in the spring of 1928, he built, came across the street and built two more Waltons, which are the um, same model, the Waltons, but it has a little variation. 
These Walton models could be varied. You'll see here we have wood siding on one. We have a dormer window for an extra bedroom on the second floor. This was uh, obviously uh, his pride and joy, the Walton model. Unfortunately, the story has a sad ending because we know what happened in 1929 when the economy tanked. Like most builders building on spec, the bazaars were just devastated. And unfortunately, the same thing happened to Sears because they had a mortgage division supporting the honor belt sales and uh, the whole financial thing collapsed. Next, a look back to a South Seas experience at the old Kahiki. Then, a young boy's passion turns into a family business. All throughout this show, we're celebrating our 100th episode with a few of our viewers' favorite segments. So make sure to stick around until the end in order to see our number one most viewed story online. But first, we're reminiscing about one of Columbus's most beloved restaurants, where patrons were immersed in the South Seas, complete with an indoor tropical rainstorm. Tiki culture was something that was largely invented in the United States and is just, you know, grew like wildfire then from the 30s to the 40s to the 50s, then to the 60s where the Kiki was built. The thing that people took away from the Kahiki, most of all, was the initial impression of this enormous, unusual looking building near Whitehall in Columbus. It was designed by Bernie Altenbach, who was their architect, designed to look like a New Guinea meeting house, but some people see it as an inverted war canoe. They put a little moat in front of it put these huge moai on either side of the door with flaming pots on their head. And you were in a different world immediately when you pulled into the parking lot. A lot of this has been designed by Coburn Morgan. And then it, Philip Jeans did most of the moai work. Right, working from Coburn's sketches. Mm -hmm. And they also used art students from local colleges and things to create some of this. You walked in and you crossed running water. You have fish tanks on the left side, you had the, the rainforest on the right, and the very back you had this huge fireplace. You had exotic details everywhere. Every surface was either carved or painted. I think one of the funniest stories was a patron coming inside, sitting down and looking into the fake rainforest, looked out the window, saw the rain coming down, became concerned and ran out and put the top up on his convertible. convertible. That's how um, real the effects were. And that was the idea, it was an immersive experience where you were sitting in little pods that had no roofs over them in your wicker chairs, being served these very exotic drinks, some of which were smoking because they had dry ice added well, to Well, and then with the international staff, you could be being served by somebody who wasn't necessarily a native English speaker. You had a number of Cuban refugees working on the staff. You had the Japanese and Chinese wives of servicemen working. At a time, they put out an ad and they said, we're from over 15 different countries and we speak even more languages than that. And over the lifetime of the Kahiki, it became even more international and more international. The founders, Bill Sapp and Lee Henry prided themselves on the fact that they did bring in all these people from different cultures into their restaurant. And for a lot of them, it was their first job in the United States and they were just learning English. They had their costuming that was quite elaborate in the early days. We created this whole new cuisine. Here you were taking what was essentially Cantonese recipes, yes. adding in pineapple and other things to make this fictitious Polynesian cuisine. There's um, a saying about tiki culture that you have the, the food from like Japan and the alcohol is from Cuba and you know every every piece of it's from someplace else. You have the Hawaiian textures and flower patterns and it really is a bunch of cultures all coming together into a melting pot. The drinks, Polynesia they didn't have rum. Almost all these drinks were rum based. 
One of the things people always ask about is the mystery girl, yes. the mystery drink. This was something they'd actually borrowed from a restaurant down in Fort Lauderdale called the Mai Kai. Well, you would order the mystery drink mm -hmm. and then they would sound the gong, which at the beginning was a giant gong. It was like four foot in diameter. Exactly, and the mystery girl would come out who was a separate waitress. She wasn't someone you'd seen at all that night yet. Would come out in her outfit with your drink. She would bow to the uh, fireplace that was the Moai and she'd bring you your drink. This was kind of a showstopper. Whatever you were doing, you heard the gong and everybody's attention turned to that. A number of famous people ate at the Kahiki. Margin Gower Champion came and, and Ginger Rogers. Shaja Gabor, Gabor and um, Uncle Milty was there. Milton yeah, Burrow Milt stopped Burrow. in one time. And Paul Lynn from Mount Vernon Ohio had boy. an unbelievable following. Some of the first pottery was actually created by Marcy. Marcy Sapp, Marcy who was Sapp. Bill's wife. She'd gone down to Mexico and worked with ceramicists in Mexico with the idea that they would create this stuff and import it. But then when they imported the first batch, it was all broken by the all time broken, it got here, yeah. so they knew they had to do it locally. So they just started a pottery in the basement of the Kahiki. And Marcy worked on it along with family members, students, turning this original stuff out. And then later on, they worked with uh, Dick Hoffman at yep. Hoffman Pottery, and he created the, the later generations of mugs and all these different items that they used in the bar. So, you know, I always say there's three ways to get this stuff. You could buy it in the gift shop, you could steal it, or you could buy it many, many years later at auction. Yeah, and they, you know, made, I think they said 25 of the mystery drink bowls, and most of them disappeared. The thing about Bill and Lee, Lee liked to build restaurants. He kind of lost interest in them once they were up and running. Bill liked to run them. And so it was only reluctantly that Bill agreed to sell the Kahiki. So Bill and Lee sell to Mitch Boych and they immediately regret it. Michael Mitch Boych in his travels had met Michael So. And Michael So was a, a real rags to riches success story. He'd been built in China and came to the United States and worked up through the restaurant business. Mitch liked Michael So and he wanted to provide an opportunity for him. And so he purchased the Kahiki. And after a few years, Michael So purchased the Kahiki from them. But he seemed to have been more interested in franchising. And so he started manufacturing egg rolls in the basement of the Kahiki. Mm -hmm. And he got contracts with Kroger, was selling them there. Then the Son of Heaven exhibition opened in Columbus. Son of Heaven was a very popular exhibition of Chinese art. And so it was an opportunity to get his Kahiki brand, Frozen Foods, in front of a much larger audience. The frozen food business really took off for Michael So. Sales are pretty much flatlined at the Kahiki. The restaurant needed a lot of renovation and it was gonna require a large infusion of cash. The neighborhood was also declining too. Oh, absolutely. And so it was becoming less desirable for people to go there and so then he got an offer from Walgreens to purchase the site and he began developing these plans for, okay, we'll sell this building and we'll open another one when we get the opportunity to. On the waterfront, on the Scioto River. He sold it, it closed in August of 2000 and five years later he died. The Kahiki was bulldozed and a Walgreens went up and a local land developer who was working on building a CVS at the time actually was quoted by the dispatch as saying, well, at least I'm not tearing down the Kahiki. So that's how big a deal it was. People were really upset. For me, it's sad that it's gone because people, I think, would have been ready to embrace it again. It is kind of a lesson to us because there are gonna be other buildings here in Columbus that people are gonna to wanna to tear down. And you know that you need to get organized if you wanna save them. If you really firmly believe in this, do something. Next, a family business that started with a mushroom. And then, a local eatery that puts a healthy twist on soul food.
We're continuing our celebration of Columbus Neighborhood's 100th episode with another story that touched our heartstrings a few seasons ago. That's right. It's about an entrepreneur with big dreams who started a business growing mushrooms when he was only seven years old. Hi, my name is Hilaria Watkins and my business is called Tiger Mushroom Farms. Yeah. My first meeting at Cub Scouts, I grew cat grass and basil. It was so interesting, I wanted to keep growing stuff. Then my parents wondered what could we grow in the winter, and I said mushrooms, because mushrooms can grow in the dark. So we did some research, because we were like, mushrooms? Like, who knows anything about growing mushrooms? So we bought a box kit, about yay high, put it on the kitchen counter, watched it grow, everyone in the family loved it. And so we tried different types of mushrooms, different varieties, lion's mane, oyster, uh, portobello, white button, and we fell in love with shiitake and oyster mushrooms. We figured out that shiitake needed to be in a cold environment and oyster needed to be in a hot environment. And our basement was really cold and our spare bedroom was really hot. Our um, blocks made from sawdust. We put high helium on it and we have to water it every day so the mushrooms will grow. And so the myceliates um, in about 17 days and it starts to pin. And so once it starts to pin, we make sure the humidity is right, make sure the temperature is right, and the lighting in the basement is perfect for it. It loves the environment. Um, and about the 17 days at the end of that, they just, you know, it's ready for us to harvest them. They kind of umbrella out a little bit. You want to get them before they start to curl up because that means you let them stay too late. So we get down here every day and monitor and make sure we harvest the ones that are ready. We harvest twice in the morning and in the evening time. Like these sawdust blocks, they're just starting maybe seven days ago. So towards the end, when they're ready to be harvested, the spores will be in the air. I mean, it's almost like you cloud, a cloud, and so you need to have the mask on to make sure that you're not breathing in the spores because it may cause some type of infections in your lungs and things like that. We grew too many mushrooms and we couldn't eat them all and, and they would rot, so we thought that we could sell them at North Markets. Well, you have to have a vendor's license and then you have to have insurance, so we said we might as well make it a small business. And he was a Tiger Cub Scout, so that's where the name came from, Tiger Mushroom Farms. I have a right, question. Yes. Um, how do you grow these? We grow my shiitake from my basement. So what are the requirements for growing them in your basement? My shiitake grow from sawdust blocks made from sweet gum and oak. Going to the markets has really taken them away from the home and being on video games and all of that. So they're out in the open. Um, they're meeting new people, meeting different people, having conversations. I love it and they're telling him stories and he's telling them stories. So it's just really good to see him just, you know, venture out. And also for my daughter, which is a little, a little shyer than he is, for her to see her confidence level go up as well as talking and selling at the market. Hello. Like to try a sample. And then rejection was one of the things that at first I was a little, you know, concerned about because people come by and they say, well, no, no, no. And I thought it would affect them. So at first I was like, oh, but you know what? We taught them, you know what? That's life. You know, you're going to get rejection. And so they deal with it perfectly, I would say. It's a way to eat the mushrooms, you know. We started out at one market and then another market. And then people are asking us to bring more mushrooms and come to more markets. And so we're trying to expand. I would like to build a big giant factory to sell mushrooms all around the world. Our next step is trying to maybe get a warehouse and grow mushrooms in there so that we can, you know, supply the demand. I would love to grow morels. A lot of people, when they come to the market, they'll ask us, oh, do you guys have any morels? I'm like, no. That's his goal now to try to grow morels. So we'll further along, I guess, experiment and look into it some more and see if um, in the future he can grow morels. You can cut up these pink oyster get bow tie pasta um, and get some alfredo sauce and some tomatoes and spinach and cut those up and put it in and, and cook it. <laughs> that, and it tastes so good. 
We are doing this full time now. This is a business that we're trying to help our son grow, and it's something that we will give to him once he's 18 and when he's ready to take it over. We supported him when he had that first little dream of having a mushroom farm. We didn't know anything about it, so it's like a learning curve for us, but it was something he was passionate about. We said, well, we're gonna try it, and it just got bigger and bigger, and so we said, hey, let's roll with it. Thank you, sir. Thank you very Thanks much. So much. We've really enjoyed looking back at just a few of the stories we've brought you over our last 100 episodes about people and places that have helped shape Central Ohio. But this last story not only impacted viewers here locally, it really spoke to viewers all over the country, getting over a million views. Drum roll, please. Here it is. Willoughby's is a healthy, soulful pop-up and catering company and our whole idea is to just serve much better food, clean food to the general public. Uh, currently, we have a pop-up at Hills Market Mondays and Fridays with a pop-up location coming uh, spring of 2018. Healthy food, uh -huh. but soul food. Oh, yeah. Soul food. Where does the soul come in? What are we talking about? We're talking about soul food, and we're talking about power foods, so you just put the two together. That's all. We want to make sure that we are thinking about um, the African-American history of uh, cuisine, but we want to do it with a healthier spin. So we want to make sure we're keeping the pipes clean. Uh, kale pesto pasta. I wanted to fuse two power foods, uh, kale being one of those power foods, and quinoa. So the pesto is made out of quinoa. And it's a gluten-free pasta, so you have Fresh garlic, you have olive oil, um, you have sea salt, um, some fresh lime, uh, a little smoked paprika. To keep a nice balanced nutritional profile um, is always at the forefront of the ingredients that are chosen. My mother in, infused love and we, we had a, a large family in front of this stove. She had to be very, very creative. And how she approached life and everything, she infused love. Oh man. So before I turn on the burner, before I grab a knife, a cutting board, before I chop a vegetable, I have to consider my spirit because the, what my spirit is goes into the food. So it has to be loved there before I can prepare anything. African American people have to be cognizant of how they eat and what they eat. And sometimes we don't do that, you know, so your effort, I, I would take it, would be to maybe kind of educate as, long, as, as well as feed folks. Is that, is that a fair statement? Absolutely, because, um, I mean, we're dying from preventable diseases. Um, when you think about the impact of heart disease in the African-American community, then you have to consider the things that we, quite frankly, put in our mouths, the foods that we eat. And um, outside of things like stress, because you want to keep your mind fresh as well, uh, quite often it's just the foods that we eat. So we want to make sure that we are, again, launching from the mission, not just the mission of love, but the mission of education and, and the mission of changing the idea that plant-based food uh, isn't great food, isn't good tasting food, and that you're gonna miss out on something. The muffins, cornbread. Tell me about this cornbread versus soul cornbread, soul food cornbread. I, I think this rivals uh, any of those. Any of those what, what's in there? What's in there? Uh. Mostly love, but there's no dairy. There's no dairy, and there's no egg. Uh, but you won't lose anything on taste. I'm going to wish you brothers a lot of luck. Thank you. Thank Keep you. on cooking. Absolutely. Keep on doing what you're doing. And this cornbread, I didn't get any cornbread. I got the cabbage and all that, but I didn't get the cornbread. So I'm gonna take, take me, sure yeah, taste it out on the way. Absolutely. Out. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, let's get you some cornbread in your life. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Yes. We got hugs and cornbread over here. <laughs> That's what we have. That's right.
Thanks for being with us, and remember you can catch all our episodes on ColumbusNeighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WOSU mobile app, and you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. We don't have opinions, just to say. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by American Electric Power is proud to sponsor WOSU Public Media Columbus Neighborhoods. Working together with our communities, we're committed to powering a bright, boundless future for us all. At Ohio Health, we believe it's important to have a healthy understanding of the world around you. That's why we're proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media and their work to educate, entertain and inspire the people we serve. Bailey Cavalieri, your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. And by viewers like you. Thank you.